relationship with Jesus completely sets us free and gives us a complete new identity. The words Josh read earlier in the service from the book of Philippians are authored and penned by a man named Paul, who we often refer to as the Apostle Paul, one of the early church leaders. And when he wrote those words, for we are citizens of heaven, our relationship in Christ means that we have changed the very foundation of our identity. And he says, we, we, we are, are now citizens of heaven, and as a result, we eagerly await our Savior from there. And today, we look at Paul's immigration moment, so to speak. It, it's, a, it's, it's a life-changing experience. You come from Cuba, you come to the United States, and internal to the United States and Texas, we kind of consider us our own thing. And so coming to the United States and coming to Texas is kind of its own moment in and of itself. But Paul leaves behind his identity religiously, spiritually, as well as even physically in Acts chapter 9. And we're going to look at that moment when Paul takes a completely new journey, a completely new place and destiny and a completely new intent on how he's going to live his life and, and what he's going to do with his life and his new understanding. So that later, actually when the book of Philippians is written by him, he's actually in prison, he's right into this church and he's able to say, our citizenship is in heaven. And we are eagerly awaiting a Savior from there. So let's go to Acts chapter 9, and let's look at the day in which Paul met Jesus. Now you'll look, as you're looking at Acts chapter 9, you'll first see that he's actually called Saul. That's his Hebrew name, um, and that's the name he's referred to at this point. That will switch in Acts chapter 9 and chapter 10, and he will go by the name of Paul from that moment forward. So if I confuse you a little bit, because I say Saul or I say Paul, it is one and the same man, and it is a new man on a new journey as he meets Jesus. And it's not just happenstance. This is strategic in the plan of God. And Paul wasn't one. Oftentimes, people think, if I'm going to make a decision to trust in God, if I'm going to make a decision to be in a relationship with God, it's got to be because things aren't going my way or because I'm confused. I don't have direction. I don't know where I want to go. I don't know what I want to do with my life. And so we tend to think about being in a desperate situation. And that does happen many times. But it's key to understanding Paul's transition here. It's key to understanding Paul's conversion. It's key to understanding Paul's switching and changing citizenship. Paul knew exactly what he wanted. He is fully determined. He is fully established in his religious and spiritual background. He has fully lived according to the teachings of that background. He, he is fully on board, even to the point of vocationally serving as a religious leader in his community. And that's described in verse 1. So Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Now Saul, using his Hebrew name, was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest, requested letters from him to the synagogues, to the local affiliations of his belief, throughout Damascus, which is outside of Jerusalem, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, which is a reference to the life of Jesus and following Jesus, he might bring them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. Paul is on a determined journey. Paul has no intentions to change. Paul has no desire to change. Paul has, Paul has no vision of change. Paul has no confusion. Paul is not suffering in any particular way. He is not hurting. He is not without accomplishment. He is everything that pictures a man of achievement, a man of accomplishment, a man who absolutely knows what the vision for his life is. And he is living it out as absolutely and fully as he possibly can to the point he is taking it on as his life mission to find these new Christians, to find these new believers in Jesus, 
to find these people who heard Jesus teach that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And if anyone wants to come to God, be in a relationship with him, they do so through him. He wants to squelch that and completely eradicate it from the faith spectrum across people's beliefs. And that's what he's doing. He leaves Jerusalem with the authority to arrest, the authority to imprison, and the authority to prosecute those who do not believe his beliefs. But this determined journey gets significantly interrupted. And you see that begin to play out in verse 3. Now I want to add one sort of footnote caveat here. There is a tendency sometimes in the Christian church... It's just been my experience, so if it's not been yours, then then don't worry about it. But if it has been, let me just make a comment of clarity, so to speak. There is a tendency to make the Apostle Paul's conversion the platinum standard for conversions. That if you're truly a believer in Christ, if you are truly one who has made the decision to follow Christ, then you were against Christ the same way Paul was against Christ. And you had a dramatic experience that revealed to you the reality and the truth of Christ the way Paul had that experience. And your radical conversion is instantaneous and immediate. In that moment, you say, yes, Lord, as Paul will say. And you then come out of that experience so absolutely changed that it is almost a sense of fanatical faith and belief. And that becomes sort of a platinum standard. And so if you're in vacation Bible school last summer and you're going to class every day and you're hearing the teachers Talk about who Jesus is. Talk about how God created the world. Talk about how deeply God loves you and how God has showed that love through his son Jesus coming here and through the death of Christ and Jesus' death intentionally to provide us forgiveness and to provide us an eternal life, to provide us that new citizenship in heaven. And Jesus' victorious and amazing resurrection that brings him back to life by his own power, defeating death so that even in death, we as Christians have no fear. If you were sitting in class and you were listening to your teachers and it just made sense... And you said, okay, I want to be a Christian. And you went home and you told your mom or your dad or you went home and you told your grandparents, maybe your grandfather, maybe your grandmother had brought you to Bible school with you. There wasn't any lightning. There wasn't any fireworks. Oh, grandma and grandpa were really happy probably when you told them that afternoon that you followed, you made the decision to believe in Jesus. And you read this story and you tend to think, did I really get saved? Did I really find forgiveness? Because my story's not like that. Maybe it's even a little more difficult than that. Even vacation Bible school and leading, being in class as a child, they help you make that decision and it seemed like a logical decision. But maybe you grew up in a Christian home. Maybe from the time, the earliest memory you've got, you remember sitting down at the table with your family and praying and thanking God for his food. As far back as you can remember, the, the reason for the season has always been Jesus. And there's always been a nativity on the buffet or on the credenza or on the table. Maybe, maybe you don't know a moment where Jesus wasn't really a part of your family because you had the blessing of godly parents who led you and helped you understand that this is who we trust with our life. And again, no lightning bolts, no voices from heaven, nobody getting upset because your conversion, your transition to Christianity disrupts all of religious society. Maybe nobody's mad at you and you have that tendency to think, It wasn't that dramatic. Let me tell you, and I say this from the depths of my heart and from the deepest part of my compassion as a pastor. God judges our hearts by our faithfulness. 
And when you arrive in heaven and you see Jesus face to face, the fact that you essentially knew him all of your life is going to be celebrated beyond comprehension. It is not the spectacular nature and the celebrity nature of your conversion that guarantees your salvation. It is your faithfulness. And I've been at this long enough. I've seen a lot of people have spectacular conversions. And then two years later, we can't find them in church. And they're not in leadership. And that spectacular conversion became a moment and not a citizenship and not a lifestyle. It does in Paul's case, but I want you to know up front as we look at this passage this morning, this is not a platinum standard by which you should measure your own spirituality. This is an illustration of a man who the entirety of his life is actually relatively dramatic. And it is a man that God is going to use in an amazing capacity. He will end up writing over a third of the New Testament. Many, if not the majority of our doctrine is based upon his writings. It is an amazing and it is a spectacular and it is a dramatic conversion. But Paul, with all of that drama, stayed faithful all of his life. It doesn't matter when you meet Jesus. It matters what you do with that decision. And so you may not have a specific date and time anniversary, but you know. You know as that seven-year-old in a vacation Bible school class, you know as that five or six or ten-year-old sitting at the table with your parents or kneeling to pray with them at night before you go to bed, you know as that teenager at a D-Now weekend or a summer camp, you made the decision to believe in Jesus, and today, as an adult, you still believe in Jesus. Your citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there. Do not be intimidated by Paul's conversion. But be encouraged, because the dramatic life change is what Jesus is looking at. It's what you've done with your faith that matters to God. It's what's happened after that moment that changes our world. And so we go into this very dramatic moment but with an assurance, with, a, with an awareness that anyone who confesses Jesus as their Savior, as their Lord, as their God, anyone who believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, that his resurrection is a historical, validated truth that changes lives and changes worlds, anyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. My heart, my goal is in about 15 minutes, you'll walk out of here with confidence about who you are in Jesus and that citizenship in heaven. And thankful you made the decision to be a Christian. Paul, his determined, murderous lifestyle on the road to Damascus from Jerusalem, in verse 3, we pick it back up again. He's traveling. A light from heaven suddenly flashes around him. Falling to the ground in that moment of glory, he hears a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't know Jesus. Who are you, Lord? That Lord at that point is not a good decision. That Lord is just simply a word that is like saying, Sir. It's as if Paul has kind of a military background and he's used to saying, sir, and it's as if he said, who are you, sir? It's an it's a expression at this point of respect. The response from the voice is, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. You're going against my people, which is going against me. But now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. In verse 7, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, 
And through, though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. And he was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. Paul's determined journey is significantly interrupted with life change. God literally stops in the middle of his journey and says, whoa, what are you doing? Why are you against me? Why have you set yourself against me? Why are you persecuting my people? Why do you hate my church? Why? And in that moment, the glory is so overwhelming, he is struck with blindness. I personally think scholars have a very number of opinions. I personally think that two things happen in this moment. He is blinded, so he is forced to spend some time thinking about what just happened. And then when he's healed in the next paragraph, he knows and he has experienced the life-changing power of God. And that's when we see true life change take place. God stops him. God stops us. The reality is in my scenario, in my caveat, that, so to speak, that I put earlier on to this moment, in that same way, when you were in vacation Bible school and you heard the truth of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and you said, this makes sense, you were no different than the Apostle Paul. In that moment, God said, stop. Why won't you join me? Why won't you be a part of my kingdom, an eternal kingdom? Honestly, I love this next few paragraphs. It's, to me, evidence of how significant the church becomes when we make the decision to follow Jesus. Paul is left in an incapacitated state. He is in a house. He cannot see. Um, he has chosen not to eat, not to drink, to fast, to try to sort out what's taking place. And the church comes to help him. It is essential to know that when you make that declaration in your heart and in your soul about your spiritual alignment and your spiritual citizenship, you gain a whole nation, a whole kingdom to help you. Christianity is lived out in community. It's not lived out in isolation. It's lived out in the people who come alongside us in these moments, who guide us and who help mentor us. The first in this passage is a man by the name of Ananias who also has a vision from the Lord and the Lord speaks to him and he responds because he knows the Lord with a willingness to do what he's told. He's got questions because he's told. There's a man named Saul who is persecuting the church and I want you to go to this house where he is at. He's unable to see. I want you to pray for him. I want you to lay hands on him. I want you to be the catalyst, the instrument I use to heal him. The healing always from the Lord. It's never from the person or the individual or the instrument. It's always from God. I want you to be the instrument, though, to be there when he's healed. And Ananias has some reservations. He, he says without hesitation, you know, and I love it. We just looked at this last week with, with um, Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth of John the Baptist. In case you didn't know God, I mean, how many times do we actually do that on a daily basis? In case you don't know, God, uh, this is actually what's going on down here. Ananias is no different. You know, hey, just in case you're not sure, let me explain to you. This man saw that you want me to go see, that you want me to pray for, that you want me to put hands on, that you want me to embrace as a brother, as a family member. He's here to arrest us, imprison us, and prosecute us. And he's already killed Stephen. Have you not heard God? Stephen got murdered last week by zealots for his faith. Maybe it's just me, but I always love these passages because I know in this moment I am not alone. I am not the first one to look to God and say, hey, did you, did you notice what's going on? 
I know you're really busy. I know you're listening to millions and millions of prayers right now. And if you hear my one prayer, I just want you to be sure that you really know what I'm up against. But Ananias, Ananias is faithful. He goes, he obeys, he comes to Saul, he comes to him, he explains to him, hey, this is what's happened. And down, way down in verse 17, he says, brother Saul, he's already acknowledging that sense of kinship already that's taking place. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road while you were traveling has sent me that you may regain sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit, have the presence of God in your life. And at that moment in verse 18, Something like scales falls off of his eyes. He regains his sight. And then here's the church. Then he got up. He was baptized. After taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul was with the disciples for some time. He's spending time in church with believers. And then immediately he begins to proclaim Jesus in the Son of God's proclaiming and announcing Jesus. He is the Son of God. In Paul's Jewish Hebrew heritage, he is announcing to them that the Messiah we have waited for millenniums for, that Messiah is here, and his name is Jesus. Never underestimate the power of Christian community. They step in as a resource. They step in to demonstrate acceptance. They step in so that healing can take place. They step in so that they have the beautiful picture and the beautiful ritual that we go through. Symbolic in nature, it doesn't save us. It doesn't, it's not his baptism that makes Paul a citizen of heaven. It's his faith in Jesus. But he demonstrates that by immediately being baptized. By immediately going with, maybe it was Ananias, maybe it was other leaders in the church. We're not given that detail. But he goes and he gets baptized because now he's a citizen of heaven. Now he's a follower of Jesus. Now he's going to channel all of that energy, that determined journey he was on that was life-changingly interrupted by God is now the new journey. And he has a community in which he's going to celebrate and live and start and live that journey. They all come around. I mean, I love it. There's friendship. There's strength. There's boldness. Because when Jesus changes your life, it becomes very difficult not to talk about it. And I know, and I know some, you know, we've all met people that are just a little on the obnoxious side. But I would ask you as an unbeliever, just be a little patient with us. We've never experienced anything as good and as life-changing as meeting Jesus. I, mean, I would tell stories all the time. I introduced you to my new cat. I could tell you all kinds of stories about that cat just this morning, trying to get dressed. I could tell you how he attacked me this week and pulled my pants down. I could tell you how every time I go to eat, he joins me, but as much as I love this cat, oh gosh, did I actually say that? We might need to edit before we post on YouTube if that's, oh no, we're already there. Yes, okay, it's a confession. I love the cat. Nothing has changed my life like meeting Jesus. And so, yeah, I talk about him all the time. In fact, everything that's good in my life I believe it's because of Jesus. I believe it's because I immigrated and became a citizen of heaven instead of a citizen of this world. I threw off the idea of some philosophical concept that might guide me and instead met a person, the person of God, and entrusted my life to him, and he's changed everything. Everything, my, my marriage, my family, my children, my career, Everything is different because of Jesus. And so you'll just have to forgive me if that's all I ever want to talk about. It's because I don't know anything better than Jesus. And I've had a lot of really good experiences. I've had a good life, and so I don't have any complaints. But Jesus is the source of everything else. It can, you can be on a determined journey 
But if you pause today and say, Lord, what do you want? Just say, say it the way Paul did. Say, okay, who are you, Lord? Ask him to speak to your heart in this moment. Do like Ananias says. I love Ananias in verse 10. His response when the Lord speaks is just, here I am, Lord. I'm ready. How do you do that today in the 21st century? On this Sunday morning, January 14th, 2023, you just steal your heart and say, yes, Lord. What do you want? Lord, I think I want to know you. I want you to be a part of my life. Maybe it is real confusing and maybe it is real difficult right now. And that desperation is propelling you forward to say, Lord, I want you to be a part of my life. He doesn't really care what your motive is. He just cares that your heart is open and willing to trust him. Maybe you can't think of a single reason why you would want to trust him in this moment. Maybe you're listening. Maybe you're listening either here in this room or you're listening on a live stream or you're listening to this live stream later after it's posted as a podcast or you're driving right now and you're listening to this and you're thinking, everything is good. My salary is good. My home is good. My family is good. My kids are good. My grandparents are good. My answer to you is you are delusional and probably need help. No. There are times when life can feel really, really good. And you say, why do I need you, Lord? I'm not desperate. I'm happy. Because whatever happiness you're experiencing now will be magnified beyond your understanding and, com and, and, and comprehension if you let Jesus be a part of it. And so maybe this is the pause. Maybe this is the moment you say, okay, Lord, who are you? And you acknowledge, I'm willing to meet you. Maybe you're like Ananias and you say, okay, Lord, here I am. Where do we go from here? Let's start that new journey. And let's start it honestly within the love and the care and the help and the resource and the healing and the friendship and the strength and the boldness of Christian community. That's what we're all about. Our church, churches around us, we are gatherings of people who have met Jesus and have experienced life change. And we want you to experience it because it is the best thing that has ever happened to us. And no one loves us the way Jesus loves us. And he's the one that enables us to love others in everything that we do. Today may be the best day to just stop and pause and say, okay, Lord, who are you? I want to know. I want to know you. I want you to be in my life. I can give you a formula if it's easier. You can just simply pray like I did. I was given a formula because I had no background. I didn't know how to pray. I just simply say, dear Lord Jesus, I want to know you. I want you to be in my life. I want you to be a part of me. Forgive me of my sin. Give me that new life and let me be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name. I prayed a formula basically just like that. And my life was changed. Like Paul, there may be some trouble ahead. In the middle part, almost towards the end of this section in verses 21 through 26, people aren't excited People aren't supportive. They're outside. Their citizenship is not of heaven, and they are not eagerly awaiting a savior from there. But I want to remind you again, in that moment, seek the community. Seek the church. That's what Paul did. You pick it up in verse 27. A man named Bartimus, when nobody, including some of the people at church, didn't want to believe Paul was a new man and on a new journey, took him, brought him to the apostles, explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He conversed, he debated with all the Hellenistic Jews. They tried to kill him and the brothers found out. They took him down to Caesarea, set him off on a road to Tarsus 
Well, he'll spend the next 10 years getting ready to do his ministry that impacts us still today in the 21st century. It could be a little bit rough if you've made that prayer, if you made that decision today. But the church is with you, just like Barnabas will stand with you. We'll believe in you. We will walk with you because we're in this together. When Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, those words the Pastor Josh read earlier, and I believe he was very intentional as he wrote out each word. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're in this together. We've all come from a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of different circumstances. Different physical places, as I mentioned earlier, my friends, Miguel and his wife from Cuba. New friends this morning, I didn't even catch where they're from. Maybe it's physical places. Maybe it's other places spiritually. Maybe I've been waiting, trying to let some other philosophy guide my life. And I haven't bothered to take time to read the one book that God actually says will change your life. And so I start off this January, this new year, reading the Bible. I would encourage you to start in the New Testament, maybe the book of John. It's a new day. It's a new time. And when we trust Jesus, we're in the middle of that new journey. You're not alone. We're with you. We'll be there for you. Because our citizenship is in heaven. The night I got saved, the guys jumped up after I told them what I had done while they were gone. And they gave me a huge old hug. And they said, oh, you're our brother, you're our family. I had no concept what they meant or what they talked about. It didn't make any sense. The next morning I went to church with them because I thought that's what Christians did. And the pastor came up and they told me, I need to tell the pastor I'm going to be baptized. And so the pastor was just like I will be down front after the service. And I told him, hey, I think I need to be baptized. I became a Christian last night. He said, great. Gave me a big hug. Said, you're my brother. You're my family. He said, Satan, the devil, he's going to do everything he can to keep you from showing up next week. So you'd be prepared. I never even knew who Satan or the devil was. I mean, I, when I say no religious background, I mean no religious background. But he said it. I believed it. That pastor and those guys I couldn't understand in those first moments became the first of many true family members who have walked with me in this journey. It is a new journey. It is a life-changing journey. But it is anything but alone. And I can guarantee you, this is a great place to begin it. So talk to us. Let us know you're starting. Let us come alongside you and walk with you. And celebrate that our citizenship is in heaven. And we are eagerly awaiting a Savior, Jesus, from there.